Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, How's Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today is going to be a continuation of the plant review series, and today I've got an interesting philodendron which was slightly difficult to come by a few years back, it's become a bit more available now, and the philodendron that I'm going to be reviewing today is the philodendron brantianum with all of the glorious silvery blister variegated leaves. But first as always for the people that are coming back, welcome back, as always you know that you should be able to find the chapters down below, so if you want to skip to your favourite part you can. For the new people joining, welcome to the slight insanity that is this series, <laughs> where I share my review on a specific plant each week from my collection, and as I always say, there is no way for this to be an unbiased review. It will be biased to my opinion of my plant with the care that I give it in my conditions, and my conditions is that I'm growing most of these plants in a conservatory in the UK, and that means different things in terms of light levels at different times of the year, and temperatures, and humidity levels, all of these things. But I will usually highlight these things within the review. I do encourage you all, if you've got this plant and you want to share your experiences with it, please do so in the comments down below. That is part of the reason why I'm doing this review series, is because there is, as far as I'm aware, no other repository of information for people sharing their experiences about how it's been growing a plant. There's a lot of information out there of people going, oh look, I just got this plant, but there is usually not very much update months or even years later as to how that plant has been to grow. So yeah, without further ado, let's move into our first topic. So moving into background for this plant, and I will apologise, there's probably a bit of glare, but I'm filming this on a Saturday morning in my conservatory, and it's a beautifully sunny morning, but that also means that I'm getting the sun smacking me in the face. So hopefully it doesn't cause too many issues for the video. But yeah, you can see the plant in front of me, as I've done with some of the other reviews, and the people that know, know why I'm looking up. But... Um, for these slightly smaller specimen plants, I will do uh, more of a close-up video so I can actually hold up the plant and show you a bit easier. If I bring in, you should be able to see a bit more of a close-up of the plant, but I will also be interspersing clips throughout the video. Now, with this plant, and actually let me show you what it looked like when I first got it. So this is what my plant looked like when I first got it from my plant care app. And you can see it has changed considerably since then. But yeah, this is an interesting one because this isn't one that I was trying to find for a very long period of time. This wasn't one that I necessarily wanted to add to the collection. So I keep looking down because the one tendril is keeps wrapping around the microphone cable. So let me see if I can just wrap this up really quickly. Right, I have wrapped up the tendril and hopefully it won't come off during the filming, but if not, I might just have to pack it back in. Because the reality with this plant is it sits on my wall next to my Monstera Albo, and this is on a wall similar to my Monstera Dubai, and I've got that review at the very corner that you can check out there as well. This isn't growing necessarily on the wall, although it had attached to different places before I brought it down. It won't cause it too much of a harm because it's not necessarily a shingling plant, it's more of a vining plant, so yeah. But when I went to find this plant, and actually that's the point, I wasn't trying to find this plant. This was a plant that just came across when I was purchasing something else, and I can't even remember what I was purchasing when I bought this plant, and the video title will have how long I've had this plant. I think it's probably crouching onto two to three years. So it's been there for a while. It's not a particularly mahusive plant, and for the eagle-eyed amongst you, that you'll see that its pot is very, very small. I have also propagated from this plant, but I will be talking about that in the propagation section of this video. But yeah, I just came across this, and because I knew that this was a plant that people had an interest in, I was just like, oh, it looked interesting. It, uh, it's, it's one of those things that it doesn't always necessarily pick up well 
in videos or in pictures because the silveriness is kind of slightly lost whenever you're doing kind of filming like this or photos. But it is quite impressive. And it was one that I was just like, mm, yes, I will, I will give this a try and see how I get on with this specific plant. And yeah, it's, it's been growing okay. I'll talk about speed of growth. It wasn't massively expensive, but again, I'll talk about that in availability. It was a bit of a filler plant. It sounds horrible, but it's it, for me, this plant was very much of the situation, the kind of impulse buy. So you're in a, usually over here, it tends to be something like WH Smith, which is a stationery store, which tends to be where you go and grab a quick bottle of water, a magazine, maybe a book before you hop onto a train or hop onto a flight or anything like that. And usually they have like chocolate bars whilst you're waiting in, in line to pay or things like that. And a lot of people, it's there to be bought on impulse basically whilst you're waiting for, to in order to pay, you'll pick that up. It sounds horrible, but that's what this plant was for me. This was a bit of an impulse buy. I wasn't necessarily going for it. I saw it there and I'm just like, yes. I will pick that as well and see how it goes along, basically. But yeah, that's generally how this plant came into my care. It has moved with me throughout two or three of my different properties. So it's been in the conservatory. It's definitely been in my previous property where I was just growing in what I think used to be a kitchen, was since a utility room in the rental space that I was in. So it wasn't getting a huge amount of light. It was relatively warm and it had decent levels of humidity. But, and I think it was possibly just towards the end before I moved from my very first house in the location that I am now, which had similar conditions, maybe slightly drier conditions, but it did okay in most of those. I can honestly say it, it's kind of rate of growth, and I'll come into that topic just now, didn't really, slow down or speed up with any of those basically. But actually let's let's look at speed of growth. So speed of growth for this one is interesting and I'll see if I can show you one of the more mature leaves so you can kind of see there and I'm trying to get it off the glare as well. So you can kind of see, maybe if I bring it in the glare, the glare might be helping us today actually because it might be showing up the silveriness a bit more. So I will be utilizing those rays of light. But yeah, it's not, and I will say this, for a philodendron, at least in my experience, and I do encourage you if you've had different experiences with this plant, it hasn't been the fastest. This isn't, probably isn't the slowest philodendron that I own, but it is vying for that position basically. I mean, it is, it is substantial, but it's also a plant that's quite a few years old at this point. Yes, this could have been even bigger, but I've had to take cuttings from it. Yes, the reality is also I probably don't pamper this as much as some other people might pamper this plant that really, really like this plant. So it's kind of left to its own devices. It's <laughs> there is a running joke about some of my plants in the conservatory tend to be the ones that I will baby quite a bit and the ones that I have a real fondness towards. And some of my other plants are just my feral plants. I'm just like, there you go. You've got a position. I'll keep watering. I'll keep caring for you. But make your own way in the world. <laughs> this is one of them. So <laughs> and I'm really hoping that I'm not the only one. I'm hoping that there's other people that have feral plants as well. But uh, yeah, it's not the fastest thing in the world. And again, I'll benchmark it like I normally do with the golden pothos. So if the golden pothos in the summer or springtime when it's kind of like the booming growing season might bring out two or three leaves in a month. This one might bring out one. I guess, maybe two if you're really, really lucky. This is also another one, and I've had a lot of people that made a comment on my Monstera Dubaia review that when I was saying that it's a plant that prefers to grow in the in-between seasons, so the springs and the autumns, where it really does kick up a gear, I would say the same thing for this. This is not particularly happy in the winter. It's also not doing, it's not living its best life in the summer either. 
Interestingly, I don't think it's to do with temperature. I think it's to do with light. So I think it prefers that slightly more muted light, light levels that it will get during the spring and the autumn. It really doesn't like the very, very low light levels that it might get or low amount of daylight hours that it will get during the winter. And it really doesn't like the exceptionally bright light that you will get in the summer months. And that might also be, I mean, it's interesting because usually when you get plants with the kind of blister variegation that you get, that kind of silveriness to that level on the leaf, it generally to me would suggest that physiologically the reason why the plant is doing that is because it wants to shelter itself from the light. So to me it might suggest that it would prefer or it's kind of used to growing in higher light situations rather than lower light situations. I have tried growing this in two different positions. Interestingly enough, the other position that I have its cutting from, the rooted cutting that's now pretty much its own plant, not quite as substantial as this, but it's getting there, is losing some of the silveriness, but that one's getting more light. So that's really interesting for me. But yeah, not a hugely fast grower. So moving into ease of propagation with this one, and it's a really interesting one because actually the way that it grows and it vines and it has, and apologies for the dry, dusty leaves, but very rarely, I'm trying to think when the last time it was that I bought this off the wall and it probably was about a year ago now. Feral plant, yeah? <laughs> Doing okay. But this one is one that propagates quite nicely. So you might be able to see that the shape of the leaf is very similar and I'm, I'm assuming it's probably very closely linked to the philodendron heteraceum, so the heart leaf philodendron. It doesn't grow in a very similar manner, that the leaf shape is very very reminiscent of what you would get with the heart leaf philodendron. Um, but actually looking at it, I'm trying to think now, uh, possibly actually, possibly the way that it grows, it's similar enough that you can see that it's kind of closely related, I mean they're, they're both philodendrons so they're going to be related, but they're very similar in their structure essentially. And I've always, and I've always been very clear on my YouTube channel that I do struggle a lot with <laughs> the easy plants and the partly philodendron or the philodendron heteraceum is one that everybody does really really well with apparently. Mm. It's one of the plants that I try not to kill on a regular basis, so I haven't quite cracked it yet. So I'm assuming, and correct me if you've got, if you grow this and the heteraceum well, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, I would assume that their care is very very similar in terms of kind of watering needs and stuff like that. But in terms of propagation, it is again very similar to the philodendron heteraceum. I have done this in pond, I have kind of propagated it in pond, it worked well, I've propagated it in perlite, it did well. I propagated it in dams, fanconal moss, it did well. I have never tried it in soil. I would assume it would also do well. It's very much one of those kind of vining philodendrons, especially with very small leaves that you chop it, you can also put it in water propagation and it will still probably do well. I think, I think I've probably tried most of things with this plant because I wasn't too sure and I thought it might be a difficult one to root out. It wasn't a fast one to root out, spot the theme for this plant, nothing is particularly fast with this plant. And I think this might be true for a lot of people out there, not just mine, but yeah, it was one that did take a while to root out, it took a beat to get going, and it's got going, and it's doing its thing, and it's feral plant number two on the other side of the room, so. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, generally easy propagation, relatively easy, relatively easy, a bit slow to get going and a bit slow to get established but not a particularly difficult plant, the, the kind of plant that I would say be careful when you need to do this and you need to not do this and it needs all these special things, it probably doesn't, as long as you give it a decent level of humidity, good amount of light, and kind of make sure that you are staying on top of whatever media it's growing in, so it doesn't have like uh, algae growing in it, or so kind of refreshing waters, making sure that the damp sphagnum moss remains damp and it doesn't dry out, things like that. You should be relatively okay with this one, so relatively easy to propagate. So availability with this one is an interesting one because 
as I mentioned, this was a filler plant for me. So this was an impulse purchase. I kind of put it in my basket and purchased it. I'm trying to remember if I even got this from a physical store or a physical interaction with somebody or whether or not, I'm to, oh, I don't even know if I got this from a swap. I really cannot remember. Uh, this, is, this is the thing like, most of the times I will remember from the plants that I really have a high affinity to, I will remember a, a lot of their backstory. You can usually tell if I'm struggling to remember how this even came into my care, that uh, it wasn't one that I necessarily wanted. I'm not poo-pooing on this plant throughout this video, even though it probably sounds like I am. I still don't mind this plant. But um, yeah, it was a lot more expensive, at least here in the UK. I don't think this was a particularly difficult plant to find in the States, because I was watching YouTube videos two or three years ago when I got this, and I saw a lot more people getting it. I don't think this is one that you would have got back then, at least, in the big box stores, but you could come across it. And I don't think it was as expensive as it was here in the UK, and I would imagine Europe as well. So in terms of pricing, when I got this, probably, and I'm trying to remember now, and again, I would have hopefully, and I'll put it again here, what the picture looked like from my plant care app, but it was one that I got that I think was only one or two leaf cutting, it was probably rooted, but that's pretty much how I got this specific plant. And it was, I would say mid double digits. It wasn't that expensive. Do I think it's the same price now? I think no, it has considerably dropped. I don't think, maybe for a single leaf cutting, maybe if it's not rooted, you probably get it for high single digits now here, but it definitely has come down in price. Again, I would imagine it's because it's it might not be the fastest thing to propagate, but it's not the hardest thing to propagate. So I would imagine if there's enough demand for this, then people can propagate it relatively easily. Demand, I think, is the key thing here, because I don't know whether or not a lot of people get super excited about this plant. I know a lot of people that do want this plant, not desperately, but they want this plant because they want to have a collection of silver plants. And this is a relatively, in relation to a lot of other slightly rarer silver leaf plants, this is one that you can probably get a bit easier, basically. So, yeah, I think in that respect, is it going to get cheaper? Maybe. Is there going to be a huge boom of interest in this plant? Probably not. I mean, this, for me, I think, and from what I was able to see online, there might be a slightly more mature form of this, and I will correct myself if I, <laughs> when I'm doing the editing and I go and do another search to see if there is a much more mature form of this, but I do think that the leaves stay relatively, I mean, that this, I think, is the shape that it remains with. They might just get a bit bigger. So it'd be very similar to the Mycans or the Hederaceum, that if you really give it something to attach to, like a wall or a plank, the leaves could get as big as my hand, and arguably at that point it might be a bit more interesting, but I, I don't know whether or not this is going to be one of the plants that people are going to necessarily lust for at a crazy level. So yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say about availability for this one. Moving on to pests with this one, and I, when I brought it down from the wall, and hopefully, how am I not finding this now when I was seeing it before, and I'm trying to see, I don't know whether or not I'm going to be able to bring it up to the camera so you can see, <laughs> uh, for the people that might be able to see that, I don't know whether or not this is going to pick up, maybe if I kind of bring that there, can you see the slight webbing? That is not spider bites, that is spiders. So I kind of leave, as I've mentioned on previous videos, regular household spiders that live in here are more than welcome. I will pay them to live here. And by pay them, I mean I will let them survive and eat all of the pests off my plants because it's free pest management. Spiders generally have never bothered me, to be fair. And I can understand that there's a lot of people with arachnophobia out there. I do apologize for even showing you the webbing. but. I was seeing this a moment ago, there was, when I bought this down, there was a couple of <laughs> people that have been here for a while will know what I'm going to say, a couple of mealybugs. But generally with this plant, thrips have been an issue at some point, very briefly, it never got out of control. Spider mites, for me, have not been an issue. Mealybugs have, 
but and I find that generally with these kind of heteracium esque plants, mealybugs generally will tend to gravitate. Not to a crazy level, but they will go there. White flies, because I have occasionally had white flies in here, will tend to gravitate towards these leaves, not to an alarming rate. Which is quite interesting, because white flies will tend to go towards leaves that are kind of bright. And I would imagine with the silveriness that it might be bright, but maybe, I don't know, maybe it's it's more kind of a, a bright yellow or green, and these tend to be much more silvery. So maybe that's why it isn't. But generally, not a massively pest-prone plant, I will say that. So coming into care and accessories for this plant. So for the eagle light amongst you, you would have saw earlier on when I picked it up, it is growing in pond. And I found this, the reason why I moved it into pond, I had it in my light aroid soil mix, light airy aroid soil mix, but, and I had it in terracotta and I also had it in a net pot. The root system of this plant, at least in my experience, has not been extensive and it does have very, very fine roots. I also found that maybe this is where it differs a bit from the heteracium, or maybe that's what I'm doing wrong. This one doesn't really ever like to fully dry out, and it would make sense to me because there's not that many roots in it, and the roots that it does have are quite small. So. I thought Pond is a good one, eventually transitioned it into a reservoir, and it's been doing a lot better since it has those conditions now. I don't even fully, with a lot of my other plants, I will usually fully let the Pond dry out even after the reservoir is dried out before I then rewater. But with this one, I don't usually ever do that. Maybe a tiny bit, but I won't ever usually let the substrate go fully dry because I do find that this plant will throw a bit of a hissy fit for me. Now, uh, for the eagle-eyed, this is on a janky support stick. The OGs will know the joke there, but with this plant, I would say that it, it would really prefer something like a plank. And it, you probably would get something more substantial in terms of leaves, not hugely so, but if you really want it to size up to its biggest potential, I would say probably giving it something like a plank to grow on. It does grow okay, it doesn't, the leaves don't necessarily get smaller, some of these are smaller than others, but then you also get some bigger leaves. As long as it's got some form of support, you could let this trail down, I know a lot of people that let this trail down, I do think if you let it fully trail down, and I'm trying to show you some of these leaves that were a bit more trailing before they were able to reattach at the top, they do get a bit smaller, so bear that in mind. Some people don't mind that basically, you might want to go for those slightly smaller leaves, because they're slightly smaller, slightly silvery, heart shape. It's almost reminiscent of the string of hearts. Now, the one thing I will say, if you want a plant that will get bigger and longer faster, and you don't mind the detangling, and you don't want the big, big heart shape leaves, you're okay with the slightly smaller ones, if you were gonna trail this, then I would actually argue to say, just go for the string of hearts. That would be a better option, I think, than this one. But that's just my opinion here. But overall, it's not particularly, other than those things, I say this, I've said that it's been fussy with all these other things, and now I'm gonna say it's not particularly fussy. I mean, it's, in the grand scheme of things, it could be fussier, basically. And as I said, feral plants. So I've kind of let it to its own devices, and it's done okay. So coming into final thoughts for this plant, and I've had to put it down because after a while it does get heavy. Pond, after a while, gets really heavy if you're holding it, even in such a small container. But, so I'll start off with the way that I normally do, which is knowing what I know now. Would I, and I didn't have this plant, would I add it to my collection? Maybe, probably leaning towards no. It's not been a bad plant, don't get me wrong. It doesn't bring me any level of joy, it never has done. I've also got a lot better since those days when you first start getting into plants and you buy everything and anything, and then all of a sudden you've got loads of plants and you're caring for a lot of things and they're adding stress to your life, and you don't even like half of them, to be fair. You just added them in as filler plants. This is one of the last remaining filler plants that I haven't kind of rehomed to friends and all these things. So I've got a lot better 
after years <laughs> of spiraling into that kind of uh, line of thought. And I'm not going to be one of those patronizing, condescending people that say, you should not do this. It doesn't matter what people tell you. You might still go through that process. Most of us have gone through that process and can come out the other side now and be smug about it. But you'll do it in your own time. But it is one of those plants. And I've, as I said, I've got better now at just not doing that because they take up space in my collection, which I don't have that much space remaining, which also then kind of goes to the point where, do I let this plant go after I've been growing it for such a long time, even if I don't like it, because you, you kind of feel that you owe it to the plant to keep it going, but maybe reframe the brain at that point and just kind of say, no, I'll give it to a friend and they'll appreciate a slightly more mature plant. So yes, this is for me, uh, maybe, but probably not knowing what I know now. It just doesn't excite me. I've had it for a while. It, it hasn't really changed. Is it a particularly difficult one? No, but even the small amount of difficultness that it might have isn't enough of a payout for what it gives for me. Again, my opinion on this one. Yours might be different, and I do encourage you if it is, let us know down below. But um, yeah, then moving on to the score overall for this plant, from zero, one being the worst, 10 being the best. And I'll give a bit more of a kind of honest score for this one. I would probably give it a five or a six. I mean, I don't completely hate it. I don't love it entirely. It's a five or a six. It's kind of middle of the road. It's okay. It's not tick. It's not massively difficult for no payout at all. But it also isn't the wow for me. For me, I keep saying this so many times in this video, for me, because I know that some people do truly love this plant, and this is not me poo-pooing on your experiences with your plants. But yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say about the Philodendron brantianum. Uh, and as always, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon, and I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.